Well, I was born in Vegas, Las Vegas. Uh, my dad was in security with Mirage Hotel and Casino, and my mom, I think she said she was a Kino runner there in Vegas. And they met and had a one night stand, and he was married to another woman. And um, she got pregnant with me on that one night stand. She was very abused as a child, sexually and physically, emotionally, and she was a wreck. And she was always into drugs and alcohol and, and selling drugs and stealing and a lot of, just a lot of illegal behavior and prostitution and a lot of things like that. And the only thing that I remember really growing up that was consistent was it was always chaotic. Like I never knew what was going on and I never knew what the day was gonna hold. I remember when she was, when I was younger, when we lived in Los Angeles, I think I was probably five or six, that she would go walking the streets and uh, she would take me with her. And I remember when she found the client or whatever, that she would leave me on the street, on the curb, waiting for her to finish. My mom, even though she's crazy, she's quite the con artist. And she never really had a job, but she always found a way to do something, whether it was through like the government stuff or or friends or whatever, but I remember we were going into, I think it was just like a, a four square church or something. And right before we walked in, she stopped me and she held onto my shoulders and she looked at me and she says, we're going in this place so we can get what we need. We don't believe what they say. We don't believe in their God. They're liars, they're hypocrites. You don't believe it. And I think I was probably seven then. And so, um, it's not just like I didn't know about God because I didn't really go to church. I was told not to believe in God. And I was told that it wasn't real. And I was told that we're on our own. And, and that it's just, we got to look out for number one. We lived in the projects. And everybody that was there, a lot of them had bell ringer jobs during, uh, during Christmas time. And they knew that the Salvation Army did a lot of social stuff. So just the neighbors kind of told her, that this is what's there and we never had a car or anything like that and so the lady that did the social services came to our house and she dropped off a food box for us and I remember her bending down and saying Lisa you know we have uh, we have youth group at the church you should come do you think you'd want to come and I said yeah I would want to come and, and it was scary thinking that this is somebody new and and uh, a group of new people that I was really vulnerable and just scared and afraid, what would they think of me? And I was so afraid that they would find out who I was or where I lived or who my mom was and or the kind of things that she did. But everybody just wants to be involved with stuff. Everybody wants to be cared for. And I just wanted to be loved. And I thought, I'm not loved here with my mom, but maybe somebody there could love me. And I was right with that. I started just with coming to youth group but for like maybe just a month, just only going to youth group. And then um, I felt a little bit more comfortable and I had really underdeveloped social skills from being with my mom and moving from place to place and not really being in schools for consistent amounts of time. And um, there's always like a, like the weird kid that gets picked on and is all kind of on the outside. And I was totally that weird kid on the outside and even though I took that role, there was still love and there was still companionship and there was still friendship, even for the weird kid that sat on the corner. And they loved me enough that I didn't stay on the fringe for very long. I was a sophomore in high school and um, I had never had friends over my house because my mom never cleaned and she smoked like probably three packs of cigarettes a day and there was ashes all over the house. And things had kind of started to get better between my mom and I. So I thought maybe today, maybe today we can have a sleepover. And and um, I remember giving my mom maybe two weeks notice saying, I'm having friends over on this day. Please come and clean the house. I'll help you. I'll do it. We'll clean the house. And she would say, yeah, I will clean the house. And times passed and she didn't do it. And it was that Friday that my friends were going to come home after school to stay over and she hadn't done anything. And I came home and and uh, the house was still a mess, and she was almost passed out drunk on the couch, and I just lost it. And I was crying, and I said, I don't ask anything from you, and I ask this from you, and you can't do this, and you knew this was important to me. And things started to get physical, um, as they usually did. We often got in fist fights. And, um, and we fought from 4 o'clock in the afternoon when I came home till 11 o'clock at night, just around the house, throwing things, screaming at each other, crying, fighting, pull hair pulling. 
And uh, then she said, that's it, get out. And she took my backpack and opened the door, threw it outside and said, get out, I'm done with you and I don't want you anymore. And I went out and I thought it was too late for me to call my pastors. So that's when I went to the 7-Eleven and uh, I called the I called 911 and I said, it's too cold to sleep outside again and I don't know where I, where I can go. So they sent a squad car and a police officer came to the 7-Eleven and he put me in the back seat. He drove to my house and knocked on my door and my mom came to the door and I was in the squad car while I was watching them. And uh, he was talking to my mom and I could see him looking inside the house. And he talked to her for a little while and then he came back, but he just went to the trunk and he got a camera. And he went in the house and he took pictures of the whole house, how messy it was in the kitchen and everything. And he came and he sat in the car and he turned around and he said, if you were a dog, we wouldn't let you go back in that house. We can't let you go back in there. And I said, yeah, it's pretty yucky, huh? And I said, what did she say? And he just kind of hung his head and he said, she just said she doesn't want you anymore, that you're too much trouble, and she just doesn't want to deal with it anymore. On, I believe it was Monday, um, I went to the court system and my my officers, Pam and Duke, were there to pick me up and to take me home. And I was released to their custody, but I was in kind of in between them and my mom for about a week. I remember laying on the floor of my room on my face, crying and praying and saying, God, if you're real, do something. Take me out of this place. God, if you can do it, I want to go with them. And the next, uh, it was just a few days after that, they called me into the family room and all the kids were there. And, and um, Duke said, you know, we love you and we prayed about this. We've talked about it as a family and we've spoken to the divisional leaders and we want you to come with us and we want you to be our daughter. And it was like, like, this can't be, this can't be for real. This can't really be what I prayed for. And not only did God give me the desire of my heart to go with them, to be their daughter, to be in a safe place with people that loved me and that could take care of me, he did it in a way that I had to go through the legal system. I had to go to court and they got legal guardianship of me two days before moving to California. I don't know, I think maybe, maybe they just saw something that I didn't see at that point. Maybe they saw the hope of something else, the hope of growing up, the hope of being better. And before them I had no hope and I don't know what I would have gone back to or what I would have gone to if they would have gotten rid of me. but. You know, my dad just, he's told me before that we don't give up on people. We don't do that and people will hurt us and people will let us down because that's what people do. But that doesn't mean that we need to respond to them in a way that casts them aside. And maybe you're not going to take them into your home and raise them as your child, but you can take them into your church and love them like you love everybody else. I don't know what else we can do in the world but love people. And I think I know that a lot now because my parents did that for me. When they had every reason in the world not to, they embraced me and they loved me right where I was. And things weren't always perfect, but nobody's life is perfect. But just that they, they loved me no matter what, no matter what.